Okay, today we're going to discuss Demuzid, or later known as Tammuz, and his connections. You'll probably hear quite a few things that'll make connections for you. A few of them I'll add to also and see if you can't see that in it also somehow. Demuzid, or Demuzi, later known by the alternative Tammuz, is an ancient Mesopotamian god associated with shepherds, who was also the primary consort of the goddess Inanna, who was later known as Ishtar, and Diana, or Persephone, and others, such as Inat, where we get the name for Anatolia in ancient times, which we call Turkey today, or Asia Minor. In Sumerian mythology, Demuzid's sister was Geshtinana, the goddess of agriculture, fertility, and dream interpretations. In the Sumerian king's list, Demuzid is listed as an antediluvian king of the city of Bad Tibera and also an early king of the city of Uruk. Uruk is one of the earliest known cities and also it says so in the Bible right there in Genesis but I've made connections before on the Genesis story and how a lot of it is taken from the narratives of these stories which are the earliest of poetic and prose music sacred geometry all kinds of things and we're finding out more and more and more. Just recently we found out a tablet which, which some people thought was gibberish when looked at by a mathematician who knew what the hell he was talking about, realized that this is trigonometry. And it, but it's based on six instead of ten. But, wow, it's a real easy little formula here and everything. I made a different video about that. But amazingly how we find out more over time and more over time and it slowly unravels especially whenever it's trying to be hidden somewhat for a long time and by being hidden people kind of sloughed over it and it went back into the mist of time unravel this first little paragraph that they have here talking about Inanna and Ishtar and of course this is Isis but also Venus And Demuzid's sister was Geshtinana, who was a goddess of agriculture, fertility, and dream interpretation, but almost mimics in some way the ancient Egyptian god of fertility, where the plants grow up out of his soil and so on, too, in a way, because she was kind of the antithesis of spring and its growth that goes through and then the death of winter where if she went away which this ought to sound familiar to Greeks as she went away then everything faded away and all through winter and stuff but at springtime at a solstice a point here again things started coming back to green just from her going away and it was from her mother's lament for it and so on but that lament is carried on and we'll talk about where these cults went to that are of the earliest that we have of recorded stuff but as I've shown before in some of these earliest tablets it does speak of them and whenever the Sumerians over iterate something they're trying to point something out and and or give weight to it so whenever they tell you in one of the earliest forms of this that they find that this happened long ago this happened long, long ago. That they're not talking about a couple of weeks or a couple of years here, but long, long ago, before the time they have here. One version of which says it's before bread was ever broken. And we find bread from what apparently are these same people here going back some 16,000 years. And if we want to go off oat, grains that are making bread before that it goes back even further but that's for other videos
but it's in the Sumerian kings list. Demuzid is listed as an antediluvian king, which is like before the flood, but this isn't the one from the Younger Dryas and the situation that was carried from the starting of this whole concept of an idea of what have happened to humanity's fall. So they had something going on, and these people that carried it on from that point knew and remembered it somehow, and it got entwined into a mythology that because of its nature got twisted into other people's lives that it happened and stories that go around it's it's amazing i'll show you a few of those connections here but but in the city of bad tabira and also an early king of uruk and bad tabira they talk about in tablets is where metals were smelted down and made fine and all kinds of things off of it but uh these people had connections all the way through India. They had connection to Sri Lanka and some of the stones that they have from there, but that's nothing real new. You know, they found Inanna statues and where she's described as being a, somewhat a redhead with green eyes when she becomes a goddess of war. She has red eyes. And they found quite a few statues that have these red inlaid eyes and they've realized that those stones actually come from Sri Lanka. But that's nothing really new. The weird thing is, is whenever we look at things like Sutton Who and all of these different sword hilts and things we find with all those intricate designs that are inlaid by garnets and red, st red stones here that you're familiar probably with seeing, those also came from there. Showing you a big connection network, but let's let's talk about connection networks. Let's see if I can make one for you here that might just brush past people. In the Sumerian poem, Inanna prefers the farmer. Demuzid competes against the farmer in Kimdu for Inanna's hand in marriage. Period. Let it sit there for a second. Read the rest of the paragraph and we'll come back. In Inanna's descent to the underworld, Demuzid fails to mourn Inanna's death, and when she returns from the underworld, she allows the Gala demons to drag him down into the underworld as her replacement. You see, Inanna later regrets this decision and decrees that Demuzid will spend half the year in the underworld, but the other half with her, while her sister, Gesht Inanna, stays in the underworld in this place, thus resulting in the cycle of the seasons. Well, this is something written in the stars to people as the zodiac goes around throughout the year. But it also does it as a great year through zodiac signs, which, you know, like we're in the dawning of the age of Aquarius now. Jesus was the symbol of Pisces for good reason and fish. Also, he was a twin. Thomas means twin, and I did a recent video about that. We'll talk about twins here. I don't know if it got past you there. It usually does. First sentence again. In the Sumerian poem, Inanna prefers the farmer. Demuzid competes against the farmer in Kimdu for Inanna's hand in marriage. What are we talking about? Well, we're talking about a shepherd versus a farmer. I told you that the Sumerians had a lot of connections with stories in Genesis, but you probably can't even see it at this point. We talked about sacred twins, and uh, earlier we did a series on brothers and sacred brothers, how there's brothers that one did this, one did that, so on like that. I have a brother. I feel it's somewhat you know, evident there too. But the connection here is that there's a farmer or somebody who tends the crops and then a shepherd who tends the fields and stuff. And there's somebody who wins, somebody who's trying to win an honest hand in marriage, whether if you think there's no women else other than this in the biblical type idea, or even at that time, if you somehow can come up with that idea in your mind, that there wouldn't be... I guess that would be Eve then because Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain and Abel, and that's it, right? But then the brother thing, see, this is what's amazing about the tale is that it tw twines and twists it together because we have the brother thing. But also, there's that concept of a sacred or divine twins 
and by the killing off of that situation that kind of gave you the idea of which one they were choosing as being the one but then because of a problem he was banished to the land of Nod where he took a wife which when no one understands how that worked out not to go too deep into that let's just say that right after that they said that they built a city and city involves a whole lot of people and things going on and not necessarily just two people and it would surely take a long time for that concept to even become tribal and grow into cities so it really is a strange conflagration but if you want to find the stories of Genesis you can find it in the Sumerian tales and in Gil Gilgamesh which I've mentioned a few times in a few videos did a whole series on it but that's been a couple of years ago so there's a connection and it goes with the season of the cycle of the world and its seasons and so on but again talking about Gilgamesh and the other tales the earliest that we have Gilgamesh references Tammuz in Tablet 6 of the Epic of Gilgamesh as the love of Ishtar's youth which she's telling that she he's not going to marry her ha, ha, ha who was turned into an Alalu bird with a broken wing uh, Alalu blurred I think I hope they show the blue one yeah, uh, well, you can barely see it out the shot there, the, but uh, let's see if I can get it up. Yeah, it's a pretty bird here, right? But uh, so they connect him that in the color blue in situations. But uh, this is known as a roller type bird because they do aerial acrobatics. They flip around and do things like that. But there's also a roller rocker pigeon. And Inanna is known to be associated with this pigeon rocker rollers. And they've got these famous ones now that they'll go up in the air and then they just start doing backflips all the way down and get going again backflips all the way down it's it's kind of amazing to watch if you if you want to look it up there'll be video about it or a hundred but also this bird had this broken wing concept and as I was a kid I saw this idea before with a killdee here in Texas and all over southwest United States we have this thing like a killdee and if you get near or even close to like their little nest that they hid and they're kind of modeled and, and looking like ground, grass, and so on. And so they'll come out and start making all kinds of noises and feign that their wings broke and try to draw you away. And they don't get in between the nest. They kind of get far away. We threw the Frisbee one time up on top of the school and had to climb up by poles and get up on top there. And when we did, this bird started freaking out and going all around. And we got our Frisbee and came back and then realized that right next to a pole there was this puddle that was built that she had made and there's a nest and there I said hey, don't mess with it and everything don't touch it and, and we went to go off and she still kept trying to lead us away and all these things and we went and got down and played more frisbee but there's that concept of the broken wing bird Demuzid was associated with fertility and vegetation so you can see the connection with spring in the situation like that and the hot, dry summers of Mesopotamia were believed to be caused by Demuzid's yearly death. During the month in midsummer, bearing his name, yeah, it's a month of Tammuz. In fact, it's actually still in the Hebrew situation we have today. People all across Mesopotamian world would engage in public ritual mourning for him. The cult of Demuzid was later spread into the Levant and into Greece, where he became known under the West Semitic name. Adonis. Yeah, I did a series just a couple of years ago. This was updated, by the way, December 21st of 2021. So actually on the summer or winter solstice point where then it's still for three days and rises again on December 25th. But this uh, connection here I had to make doing backflips a few times to go through to end up showing it to you and uh, was oh well that's just a heretic type thing and funny they they'd want to be somewhat ambiguous and just throw things out there in a line or two like they did a minute ago with Enkidu and the fact that it's the Cain and Abel type of story but they didn't really say that they just lead it right through and then walk past it and uh, I, well, I've got something to say about that exhibit stop for a minute here we go do you recognize anything 
So, in this idea here, they've been taking this cult of Demuzid and switching it and the concept. And I've told you a long time ago, Greece gods aren't from one little mountain and one little area just around them and so on like you would think but it was gods of the whole area and that's reflected in people that no longer existed shortly after this and the Minoans and people like that ancient Canaanites and their god El which we'll kind of get into in a minute here but uh, Adonis is hooked up into this well how can you find that in the Bible well I'm fixing to tell you about that but also have you ever noticed that they that first they just wrote this tetragrammaton, which is letters, which it just means something else, YHVH, if you will, leaving out, the, of course, the vowels, as it was done in ancient Hebrew and Phoenician, where it comes from, and so on, because that's just a sound, which can be done with little ticks over and above the letters by the way that they're turned, and you're supposed to realize that. But then if somebody wants to admit that, we. Then it got changed, and even to this day, there's a lot of ascetics and so on, that whenever his name comes up, they refer him to Adane. And this is that same connection. So a lot of times I've turned around and told you, a lot of this goes back to da-da-da, and, you know, Demuzi and that. They had this ancient tree that they used to go out and have a sacred grove, which we'll talk about here in a minute. And this sacred grove, they would pick out a special tree. And, uh, oh, well, that sounds like the Yule thing and the Druids. Yeah, 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 yeah they, had, they had this too. Yeah, so did Proto-Indo-Europeans all up north and everything. Sacred forests and all this. Yeah, yeah. Cedar forest we hear about in the Bible and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same in the Sumerians and stuff. And Umbamba, yeah, yeah. Okay. But they'd pick out this tree and do this thing in the winter solstice and everything, and then they would take a tree symbolic of that into their homes and try to keep it alive through the year and every, uh, through the death of winter and stuff. As an evergreen tree is a symbology of rebirth, and they're flipping around, and that's actually got presents onto it, and they decorate the tree. So that's kind of where our Christmas came from along with other things and later there's Yule configurations and so on that come out of that but that's much later of course or is it see and then the same thing here reflected in the cult of Adonis which oh this is about the 16th thing I've been able to show and actually I've done some videos here recently that I just take the wiki article and go off of it why because I used to have to jump through hoops and read the wiki article and get to a point and then let me show you this. Whereas it's funny, at least half of what I said is kind of put in here. Other things just make a passing mention. The cult of Ishtar and Tammuz continued to thrive until the 11th century AD. Oh yeah, so it, it's something that didn't just poof away and survived in parts of Mesopotamia as late as the 18th century. I'll let that stew for a second. Tammuz is mentioned by name in the book of Ezekiel. There's that L again. It's Ezekiel 8, 14, and 15, and possibly alluded to in all other passages from the Hebrew Bible. In late 19th and early 20th century uh, scholarship of religion, Tammuz is widely seen as a prime example of the archetypal dying and rising god. It was also a sun god because of exactly the seasons, the way it works. It's the same as Jesus, though, by the way. See if it doesn't have a reflection. But the discovery of the full Sumerian text of Anana's descent in the mid-20th century appeared to disprove the previous scholarly assumptions that the narrative ended with Demuzid's resurrection and instead revealed that it ended with Demuzid's death. Well, it was actually a double flip, but wait, wait. However, the rescue of Demuzid from the underworld was later found in the text of Return of Demuzid, translated in 1963. Hence, oh yeah, 
and in fact it like double reiterates the story it's uh, pretty incredible and of course it started with Anana's death and then coming back into the real world but uh, here's a trick for you here a lot of these are hooked up to zodiacal signs and as it spins through the year there's some of those that start going down into the horizon and whenever it becomes night you're not able to see them anymore and those are during the death of winter considered to be the ones that are the underworld if you will because that's where you're able to see it because they knew the world was round that's just one of like 20 ways that you can find it even back in the Sumerians People try to agree that, they're, oh, the Greeks figured it out, and, and Eratosthenes, and there's a shadow, and he realized eight degrees, and the distance was, so the earth must be about this big, and just about figured it out. But you can find Sumerian stuff from way back when, because where does Eratosthenes get it from? Well, the Library of Alexandria, from copies of all this stuff from Sumerian libraries, and a lot of people. So... There's a lot to this. Probably going to go into a part two here. If we do, it'll be in your top left-hand corner. Worship of this Demuzi, or Tammuz. The Assyriologists Jeremy Black and Anthony Green describe the early history of Demuzi's cult as a complex and bewildering. Well, it's not really if you get more into it, if they look. According to the Sumerian Kings list, Demuzid was the fifth antediluvian king of the city of Bad Tabira, Demuzid was also listed as an early king of Uruk, where he was said to have come from the nearby village of Kuara, and to have been the consort of the goddess Inanna, and Demuzid, Sipad, or shepherd, Demuzid was believed to be the provider of milk, which is a rare seasonal commodity in ancient Sumer due to the fact that it could not be easily stored without spoiling. Well, not necessarily, but you can get a milk cow thing going on, but it was brought in to these people by ancient shepherds. And this is a symbolic shepherd king situation, of course, that you can see echoed in so many other people to try to show you when these things happened or not, perhaps being very ambiguous to the fact that this happened a long time ago, although we're trying to conflagrate it with somebody, like they talked about here, this antediluvian king if you look at that king's list it goes back well 238,000 years but believe it or not if they, you add it all up and everything it comes to about 432,000 years and therefore it's well really all the declamations and how long the kings start lasting which is real long which is echoed in the Bible again with people living a long time before the flood and then all of a sudden people not so much anymore. People say, well, that might have been happening before the last ice age and people lasted longer and stuff. Well, how much longer? A lot of the numbers look like it adds up to be if you're going off a lunar calendar instead of a solar calendar, that there are 13 moons basically inside of that. So if you figured times 13, all of a sudden Methuselah only lived about 78 years or something like that. So, in addition to being the goddess, the god of shepherds, Demuzid was an agriculture deity associated with the growth of plants. Well, I guess he took over after Abel. Ancient Near Eastern peoples associated Demuzid with the springtime, which the land was fertile and abundant. But during the summer months, when the land became dry and barren, it was thought that Demuzi died then. During the month of Demuzi, or Tammuz, which fell in his cult in Lagash, in the middle of summer, people all across Sumer would mourn over his death. As if it was really something happened, they had statues they would dress up and bring out, and people would start freaking out, and there was these ladies that would mourn. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. During the month of Demuzid, uh, oh, the, oh, this seems to be a primary aspect of his cult, Lagash, and the month of Demuz, or Tammuz was the sixth month of the year, and this month and holiday associated with it later transmitted from the Sumerians to Babylonians and East Semitic peoples. 
with its name transcribed in those languages as Tammuz, a ritual associated with the Ikur temple in Nippur, equates to Muzid with the snake god Ishtaran, who in that ritual is described as having died, but then re resurrected or shed his skin, kind of like a cocoon, kind of oddly like the Egyptians had that concept going on. All these seem to have, get a twist or a different flavor on that same thing, like everybody's trying to make a burger, but they're a little different, aren't they? Dumuzid was also identified with the god Ama Ushul Galana, who was originally a local god worshipped in the city of Lagash. In some texts, Ama Shumagalana is described as heroic warrior. As Amo Shumagalana, Demuzid is associated with the date palm and its fruits. And uh, we've talked about the date palm, and uh, Robert Sepper's got a video where he goes into that concept in Phoenicians. And in fact, the phoenix is a species of date palm. When people were able to name that, they were talking about how that and uh, Johnny Appleseed way got changed. And Recently, I did a video where I believe in the wiki article there, again, there was a connection that said that the date palm, which was all around the Mediterranean and Southern Mediterranean, in a more tropical time, leading out the last ice age, much later got transposed by people in that Johnny Appleseed way into Sumer and past. So... This date palm represented stability because it's one of the few crops that could be harvested all year, even during the dry seasons. And in some Sumerian poems, Demuz it is referred to as my damu, which means my son or sacred son or only son. This name is usually applied to him in the role as a personification of the power that causes the sap to rise into trees and plants, like the groundwater rising up whenever there's not much rain. Damu is the name mostly closely associated with Demuzid's return in autumn after the dry season has ended. This aspect of his cult emphasized the fear and exhaustion of the community after surviving the devastating summer. So it's kind of a flip, but then you have a end crop harvest and then that tries to carry you through winter, and then it comes back as spring. Nowadays, we're pretty much past that because we've got people north and south doing it at different times of the year and everything, and there's so much trade. But Demuzid had virtually no power outside of his distinct realm of responsibilities. Very few players addressed him are extant, and of course that are almost... Of those that are, of almost all of them, are simply requests for him to provide more milk, more grain, more cattle, or so on. So it's a, it's a wish, it's a prayer. The sole exception to this rule is a single Assyrian inscription in which a man requests Tammuz that when he, descendants, when he descends into the underworld, he should take with him a troublesome ghost who has been haunting him. I, uh talked about ghosts recently when we were coming through Halloween and how they found an inscription and this is like a depiction of a ghost on a Sumerian tablet and how to get rid of ghosts and kind of marry them off and see who can, you can find from the underworld and have him direct you into the light like Carol Ann coming to the light. The cult of Tammuz was particularly associated with women who were the om uh, ones responsible for mourning his death. Yeah, uh, there's this whole thing that went along with it, but you'll find it actually in the Bible, and that, that'll be coming up here shortly. Maybe in part two to get it, a little fireworks going. The custom of planting miniature gardens, like the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, with fast-growing plants such as lettuce and fennel, sometimes flowers, would then be placed out on the hot sun to sprout before withering in the heat was a well-attested custom in ancient Greece associated with the festival of Adonis 
in order to honor our Adonia to an honor Adonis. The Greek version of Tammuz. So here again, it's straightforward. Some scholars have argued based on the reference in the Hebrew Bible that this custom may have been a continuation of an earlier Oriental practice or more Eastern type practice than where they were from. The same women who mourned the death of Tammuz also prepared cakes for his consort Ishtar, the Queen of Heaven. So you can find it in the Bible where they actually talked about they were taking and marking these buns with a B for baby and me. And they would be the first ones offered so to get the grill going good and everything and the first grains that start off and whenever you do a harvest, whenever you start cooking for a big festival and things like that, the first ones are made or these ones that are supposed to be sacrificed for the gods, if you will. So, um, this month in the holiday associated with it was later transmitted from the Sumerians to Babylonians and East Semitic peoples with its name transcribed into languages as Tammuz, so twisting into a language you can find there, but then it has an Adonai, or Adon, which is something that's all around the Mediterranean here, and a connection that goes through there, and a conflagration, because they had so similar stories, because in a time before time and meeting, these people actually had a similar story that they had gone off of, as I've shown so many times, this month and the holiday associated with, with uh, was later transmitted to Tammuz, a ritual associated with the Ikur temple in Nippur equates to Muzid with the snake god Ishtaran. And that uh, is described as dying, as we talked about before. This custom of planting miniature gardens, though, you know, back in the day, they had the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, and it's supposed to be all that and a bag of chips, and people didn't understand it and everything, but there's a few tablets that talk about something that's along this line, and it's like them making clay or pottery with holes in the bottom of it so it leaks like the pottery for plants are today, and putting some soil in it and growing up plants and then hanging them via like a macrame, which my mom used to make some, and hanging plants. She had quite the green thumb, if you will, and hang up these macrames that had beads sewn into them in places and stuff too and the plants would be in that and that that would be a real amazing thing like well these people can do some farming this that and the other yeah you know we can got this just plants growing out of pots just left and right so they would prefer these cakes to his consort Ishtar but then in the Bible it's also listed that they would do this to the queen of heaven which God used to have a wife yeah, yeah, Ashtera these cakes would be baked in ashes and several clay cake molds discovered at Maori, Syria revealed that they were also a, at least sometimes shaped like naked women like a Venus type statue. According to the scholar Samuel Noah Kramer, towards the end of the third millennium BC, kings of Uruk may have established their legitimacy by taking on the role of Demuzid as part of a sacred marriage ceremony. This ritual lasted for one night on the 10th day of the Akitu, which is the Sumerian New Year festival. So kind of like around Christmas and we have today in a pitching like that which was celebrated annually at the spring equinox. So they're coming back and getting together, bringing the fertility of the land. As part of the ritual, it was thought that the king would engage in ritualized sexual intercourse with the high priestess of established fact, but in recent years, or a high priestess of Inanna who took on the role of the goddess. In the late 20th century, the historical histostry historicity of the sacred marriage ritual was treated by scholars as more or less of an established fact you may have heard of this before and that, that they would do it in front of people and stuff like this no it's what they gleaned out of things that were said in this colorful poetic type thing 
but they weren't meant that way. Just like we have metaphors towards marriage and things that we use today, but ain't nobody doing that, you know. It's a whole lot of metaphors we use that we don't even realize that we're using quite often. But in recent years, largely due to the writings of Pirjo Labinsky, some scholars have rejected the notion of an actual sexual act ritual, instead seeing sacred marriage as a symbolic rather than physical union, that there was this ceremony that went on there, that the idea was still implied, just like everybody talks about a honeymoon and all these things, which actually comes from this idea of it's a springtime money moon and this time whenever people get married and you're supposed to lead up into it. Our Valentine's Day comes preempted to that, kicking it all in, and then here comes Easter and a marriage idea that used to be all around that. Nowadays, you'd kind of, people get married almost anywhere, but there really used to be a cluster that was definitely around this time. Sumerian mythology, the marriage to Inanna. The poem Inanna prefers the farmer, as we talked about before, begins with a rather playful conversation between Inanna and her brother Utu, which is the son, who incrementally reveals to her that it's time for her to marry. And she also has a ritual that she does that has to do with eating pine nuts. And this was a thing about the halupa tree and the situation that also has something to do with Dumuzi, who is represented as being such a tree or an evergreen. Dumuzi comes to court her along with a farmer named Inkimdu, so that's Cain and Abel. At first, Inanna prefers the farmer, but Utu and Dumuzi gradually persuade her that Dumuzi is the better choice for her husband, arguing that every gift the farmer can give to her, the shepherd can give to her, something even better and in the end Inanna marries to Muzid, the shepherd and the farmer reconcile their differences well he didn't kill his brother Ellen? no that's trying to put two or three stories together as one again it's amazing how they're able to do that in the bible and say oh yeah there's a story that's like that yeah and it's two brothers or is that you know which which one it was well it came from elder stories that people were kind of aware of at the time and were drifting away. And so it put it all together as one. In fact, later, all of them got together and did it again and came up with a Bible idea, but that's probably too deep for right now in this small scope of this video that we're into now. Again, if when it goes to part two, it'll be in your top left-hand corner. Hopefully it won't preemptively end. So, they reconciled their differences, offering each other gifts, and Samuel Noah Kramer compares the myth to the biblical story of Cain and Abel. Ding, 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 which I had to show you separately before, because both accounts sit around a farmer and a shepherd competing for divine favor, and in favor of stories, the deity in question ultimately chooses the shepherd probably indicating that whenever they talked about God, 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 they were actually, what? Yeah, it's different ones, different times. Surely if you've gotten any into the Bible in any way before, you're reading along in it, and they talk about God said this, this, that, and the other, and everything, and then all of a sudden you come to find out that there were worse being ball, and this, that, and the other, and they have to make this switch. So you're like, oh, wow, well, really? Because, well, that makes them at Sinai, what? And whenever they talk about all these different names for God, it's supposed to be one person. Those were all different entities, too. Even in the earliest of Bible situations, that was a plural council. And it's even relayed to as such. Let's make it look in our image, so on like that. So, There's another connection. A vast number of erotic poems celebrating the consummation of Anan and Demuzov have survived. The two excerpts from a representative example are translated below. I'll try to read this out to you, and since it's just in probably English and not too too bad, uh, see if you can see these little ideas that go along with farming and this concept that we kind of still have today with some, you know, colorful metaphors, if you will. 
and then we'll get on to part two. My vulva, the horn, the boat of heaven, there's that man in a boat, is full of eagerness like a young moon. My entitled land lays fallow. As for me, Inanna, who will plow my vulva? Who will plow my high field? Who will plow my wet ground? As for me, the young woman, who will plow my vulva? Who will station the ox there? Who will plow my vulva? Make your milk sweet and thick, my bridegroom, my shepherd. I will drink your fresh milk, wild bull, demuzi. Make your milk sweet and thick. I'll drink your fresh milk. Let the milk of the goat flow in my sheep folds. Fill my holy churn with honey cheese. <laughs> Lord Demuzi, I will drink your fresh milk. So you can see that this is uh, kind of like all putting it with uh, plowing my field and make me fertile and doing things. But in a modern day, we can easily see what the connotation was in this idea. Maybe whenever I was reading it, I should have gone with this picture that kind of goes with it here. Here's a picture of the shepherd. I always thought that this was weird, by the way. It, it looks like uh, she's naked. He's not wearing any pants, but it looks like he's still wearing his shirt his belt and everything on here and you know there's a there's a name for that number they're doing here but i i can't really go on to it but uh this was symbolic of the sacred marriage ritual and there's a lot of reasons that they turned around to that and they said oh well then that's got to be that there was really this thing that went on that doing so well it's kind of implied whether it happened or not to some people or not there are other people that say that a lot of times princes that came of age, there was he was selected to play the part of Demuzi, and in doing so, this was the coming of age for him where he got to start sowing his oats, if you will. See, there's another colorful metaphor. So, it's this whole concept here, and uh, I'll go through a couple of pictures here. Let me... Here's what's coming up. Demuzi's tortured in hell. Yeah, yeah, that's an ancient, ancient picture of that. But there's also, here's a tablet of the courtship of Anana and Demuzi that they found. And of course, it's got lacuna missing, which is little knocked off parts where it's missing. But they found so many versions of this. Even the knocked off pieces have been pretty much all intact back to one. And uh, here's one uh, of the uh, lamentation over the death of Demuzi, and it's currently held at the Louvre Museum here in Paris. But just like this tablet here, they are found King's List, and again, he's a preemptive to uh, Gilgamesh and so on, and we'll see that idea. And then later, of course, they put two or three together in a concept and tried to lump it into a Marduk situation, but... That'll have to be for a separate video there. Uh, again, I a lot of times talk about these seals, which you can barely see on the left here, but this is actually whenever they drill out quartzite and so on and make that little plug and knock it out so they can you know, make a door jam that works off a hinge and everything off of it. And uh, they've got them all over Egypt, and they're like, well, how did they do all this stuff? Well, one neat thing here is that